Protagoras uses to who this epistemology very likely goes back. And he says, as we are only, and I think it's a consequent approach, as we only have knowledge about our sensations, uh, we have to move on to say that these sensations are either pleasant or unpleasant or, according to some sources, neutral. So we say what is good is pleasure and what is bad is pain. So that's kind of, uh, in simple terms, the idea of hedonism. However, um, I'm personally convinced that we don't have to stick to this definition. I think we can come up with a stronger definition of hedonism and say that pleasure is the highest good and value, but acknowledge that there are other things and values that are good in themselves and as well a fund of pleasure. I think we have such an approach in Aristotle. For Aristotle, certain activities, like doing philosophy, leading a life of contemplation, are good in themselves and also go along with strong and intense pleasure. Maybe we can call this an oidonistic hedonism. Maybe. Uh, there is a traditional proof for hedonism, which we find as well in Aristippos, in Oidoxos, and in Epicurus. Oidoxos and Epicurus and Aristippos say pleasure <coughs> is the goal because all living beings strive for pleasure and naturally avoid pain and its opposite. They do this immediately after they are born and without reflection. Hedonism corresponds to our natural inclinations that show us what is good and bad and valuable. Here's a strong objection that can be made against such an approach. Um, and this objection uh, runs just because we naturally strive for pleasure, that doesn't prove that pleasure is good. You cannot derive ethical value from natural facts. Such an argument confuses the difference between what we actually strive for and what is worth striving for. We can have natural inclinations to do bad things, for example, to torture an animal. We see this often in children, and we can say, yes, it's probably natural. Hopefully not, but probably is. Uh, and then we cannot say everything which is natural is good. That would be uh, deriving, uh, the logician said that's a fallacy, deriving an ought from an is. Uh, deriving natural value from natural facts. Natural facts is driving pleasure. Um, ethical value, pleasure. Um, I would defend hedonism by saying the basis of hedonism is not primarily a logical conclusion, but the experience and evaluation of pleasant and unpleasant experiences. When we touch a hot plate, we undoubtedly have the experience that the corresponding pain is intrinsically bad. We touch, we have even like a physical negation an immediate physical negation and the experience that this is intrinsically bad. Uh, so this is a natural physical reaction and not a logical conclusion from the natural fact that the plate is hot to the value judgment that it's good to withdraw one's hand. It would be ridiculous to say this reaction can't be justified because here we have a fallacy of deriving an ought from an id. The experience of pain goes hand in hand with the evidence that pain is indisputably bad. And the same is true for most pleasures. One remark about hedonism, we still can do some introductory uh, remarks. Um, there is a useful distinction about hedonism, and that distinguishes sensualism from satisfaction. Sensualism is usually interpreted as Aristippus was a sensualist. I think for his later school that's not true. Um, and sensualist says all pleasure is sensual enjoyment. 
food, drinking, sex, etc. Uh, from that's a too narrow concept of hedonism, I think um, we can. I think it's a better concept which we could call satisfactionism, like milk that we use in service. It's a wider concept. Pleasure is satisfaction or enjoyment, which doesn't necessarily involve sensuality. <laughs> so there can be, this is for example, when Aristotle uh, talks about the pleasures of the life of contemplation, the life of the philosopher, uh, again, it's not a sensational joy. He has, it's a, it's a satisfaction concept. By the way, uh, this distinction, I think, can also offer a solution to the so-called paradox of masochism. How is it possible that the masochist takes pleasure in pain? I think if we use this as it approaches on a second two-level analysis, um, I think we can say, yeah, the masochist, he has probably some psychological aberration. Um, and that leads to that he enjoys as satisfaction what is painful as sensation. But the masochist does not enjoy the sensation of what is painful as sensation, but he enjoys it as satisfaction. After these introductory remarks, I shall explain the steps of my talk. The first step is I will explain Aristotle's theory of the good life or human flourishing, eudaimonia, happiness. There are several translations possible, which is based on and derived from his understanding of human nature. The second step, I will criticize this theory and especially its central argument, the famous Erdogan argument, the human function argument, how this is usually uh, translated. Third, from my criticism of third step, doesn't follow that we should completely reject the human function argument. Rather, we can modify and improve it. The main modification I would propose is to move away from Aristotle's logocentrism, he's very focused on the logos, what we are as logos mainly, and include the human body as an essential part of human nature and of the good life. A modified human function argument can, this is my thesis and part of my philosophical project, provide a rational grounding or justification for humanist ethics. Again, from a modern perspective, my project raises a powerful objection. This objection has made, by example, by Bernard Williams against Aristotle's human nature project. If you're interested in this, two, the most important two texts you will find under number one on your handout. According to Williams, Aristotle moves from natural facts to ethical values and thus commits a fallacy of deriving ought from is. However, there are ways of reinterpreting Aristotle's human nature project that avoid the fallacy of deriving ought from is and deriving ethical values from natural uh, facts. Martha Nussbaum did this, did this in her interesting essay number two um, on your handout. <coughs> I think this is a very promising strategy from seeing Nussbaum, but I disagree with Nussbaum that this is what Arist that this was already Aristotle's strategy. It's a reinterpretation of Aristotle, which is worthwhile considering, but I really think it's not Aristotle. Second uh, subject, a few remarks on Aristotle and hedonism. Um, in the Nicomachean Ethics, we find two treatises on play. One treatise is book number seven, chapter 12 to 15. Uh, the second treatise is in book 10, chapter one to five. Uh, in the research, I cannot go into these details, it's disputed. Um, how, what the relation is, why do we have two separate treatises in, in one ethics, and that brings uh, up the old question, which I've also been working on quite a bit. Uh, is Aristotle like a Unitarian thinker, or did he develop, and does he have like later ideas, or different ideas at later stages? So I, I really don't want to go into 
going to this, just to let you know that the literature mainly disputed are two questions. Uh, the first question is book number 10, uh, Later. Um, yeah, there are some handouts. Is book number 10 later, a later account? Or is it, and is it a more mature account? Uh, many people think it's a later account and a more mature account. Um, I will not go into this debate. Um, just a few remarks. Uh, there are two different concepts of pleasures um, in the two treatises, in book number seven. Aristotle equates pleasure with an unimpeded activity. And in book number 10, he says pleasure completes a good activity like contemplation or moral action. And pleasure is something additional which completes the activity. 